so having said that, we can now generalize um, because we know that if we increase the constellation by having APSK, so each time we actually reduce the distance between the symbols. So any noise can switch from one symbol to another, right? Because here, for the case of QPSK, we have found that the square root of, of A divided by 2, and now the noise actually required to be less than in the case of uh, BPSK. We were lucky that for QPSK we achieved the same bit error rate due to the fact that we are actually uh, uh, we, we are using, we are using one symbol per two bits. But if we, if we were to use APSK or something, if we were to use APSK, we'll start getting the symbols close to each other, which increases the probability of error. Right? So in order to uh, try to reduce this, they have um, tried to use a combination of the amplitude and phase, which is what they call quadrature amplitude modulation. So this is the, the general, this is the general form of, uh, they call it QAM. Yes. This is a very common modulation. It's, it's, it's a combination of amplitude and phase. So, and the idea is very simple. So um, instead of trying to use, for the case of uh, PSK, mm -hmm. for the case of Fish of King, uh, we ch we, we're, we're changing the amplitude, we're, sorry, the phase, we're changing the, the phase, which means that we are going around one circle. Right. right? So if the more constellation we have, uh -huh, the shorter the distance between the symbols. Quam talks about the fact that we can have the symbols moving across multiple circles where we try to increase the constellation but use both the phase and yeah. the amplitude in order to uh, increase the, the distance between the symbols. Um, so if we, so in other words, the probability of error for uh, 8 PSK, okay, is higher compared to 8 QAM. It's higher? It's higher compared to 8 QAM. Okay. Right, why? Because for 8 PSK, for 8 PSK, mm -hmm. we have to divide the one circle eight. over 8 symbols, okay. right? But for QAM, we can divide it over two circles, which means that we have the flexibility to increase the distance between each two symbols, mm -hmm. right? In which case, we reduce the probability of error. Okay? Okay. okay. Two circles are different So uh, for the case of QAM, we yeah. said that we combine PSK with amplitude, yeah. with ASK, yeah. right? In which case, so if we were to use 8 PSK, uh, 8 PSK, so we need to divide this circle into 8 mm -hmm. symbols, which means that we have, two, we have two symbols here, we have two symbols here, we have two symbols here, and we have two symbols here. Okay? So for 8 QAM, for 8 QAM, what we will do is that we will, we will say, okay, so we can have one here, 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 okay? And then we can have another one on another circle. We'll have one here, one here, one here, and one here. So from this to this, the amplitude and the phase both have changed. Okay, so you have, it's, it's as if you have, you have one circle here, and you have another circle here. So the distribution for the 8 QAM is, as you can see, is better compared to, because if you calculate the distance between each two symbols here, 
is bitter than here. Right? So by, by using the amplitude and phase, we can distribute the symbols over the IQ domain much more nicely, in which case we can reduce the probability of error. Okay? So, so until QPSK, we're fine. Until QPSK, we're fine. So BPSK and QPSK are fine. Okay? More than that, we'll start to use QAM, which means that we need to combine uh, the amplitude and the phase okay, to distribute the symbols over the domain uh, 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 more efficiently, in which case we can reduce the probability of error. Okay? So, um, so for uh, for uh, <clears throat> for sixteen quam, for sixteen quam, we can distribute over uh, maybe uh, two circles, and each circle will have eight, or four circles. Each one has four. So we decide this based on what number of circles and distribution. Of based on w which one will give us more distance? Yeah, it will give us more. Uh, a better uh, bit error rate, okay? The one that, that, that will give us a larger distance between the symbols, the better, okay? So this is, for example, how we, uh, how we get the, um, this is 16 quam, I guess, right? So this is eight, 8, and this is 4, and this is 4, okay? So you have the flexibility, okay, to distribute the symbols in any way uh, so that you can get the uh, the best bit error rate, which means the larger the largest distance between each two symbols. Okay. So this is what we call the intersymbol interference so that we talked about before. No, this is different. No, no, no. Intersymbol interference is due to fading. Um, here we're talking about we're talking about we're talking about the the the, the white Gaussian noise. Again, the, feed, the fading, as, as Dr. Muhammad was saying, the fading is an effect which is equivalent to multiplying the channel gain by, this, by, by the signal. The noise that we're talking about here is something that gets added to the signal. While modulation. What, what, while, no, while, while, while you are transmitting the signal. While you are transmitting the signal, there are two types of noise. There is the channel uh, 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 gain and phase, which is which gets multiplied, and this is the effect of fading. Okay. And there is another type of noise, which is the additive white Gaussian noise. Okay. Um, so in general, the the received signal is equal to the sent the transmitted signal multiplied by h, okay. and added to it some noise. Okay. So the effect of fading, the effect of channel fading and stuff is here okay. okay and there is another effect of the channel which is what we call additive white Gaussian noise so the, the effect of the channel is two is divided into two things okay for calculating the bit error rate we actually ignore that that part we ignore the the uh, uh, the, the fading part and we calculate the additive part of the noise so which would be more uh, during transmission? This one for for sure, <clears throat> the additive the additive one is 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 usually more significant. Again, depending depending on what which channel we're talking about. Okay. So sixteen QM may naturally have a less beta error rate than eight QM. Has what? Has less bit error rate? Like it would be more uh, efficient than 8QA. It's more efficient in the sense that you have 4 bits per symbol as opposed to 3 bits per symbol. Right? Mm. So in terms of bandwidth mm. or spectral efficiency, it's better. Mm. But in terms of bit error rate, it's worse. 16, yes, you have 16 quam. And you have 8 quam. Okay? For 16 quam, each symbol represents 4 bits. Right? 
So the spectral efficiency is higher because in the same bandwidth, in the same signal, you are sending more data. Right? So in that case, the spectral efficiency is higher. But, but any effect of the noise can affect the, the channel because the bit error rates will be high as well. So, <clears throat> so we'll switch to a separate topic now. So cellular systems and small cell, cell structure. So we have, we know for cellular systems, we have a base station, and each base station will give you a certain range. So each base station will essentially implement a space division multiplexing which means that if I'm associated with one base station, I should be spatially far from another base station. So I'm, I'm actually associated to this base station. I'm far from the other one. So space-wise, I'm closer to this one, and I'm communicating to this one. So base station covers a certain transmission area. So each base station has a certain coverage. So each base station can cover um, user equipments or cell phones or any cellular device within certain range. That range depends on depends on what depends on the, the transmission power that I use, right? And depends on the the modulation that I use, whether I use 16 uh, because if I if I increase the modulation, okay. I increase the bit error rate right. for the same power. Increasing the modulation means that I will be able to get more. Uh, and I want to squeeze more data in a short in a in a in a in a short time and a small bandwidth. Mm -hmm. But if I do this, I increase the noise. I will increase yeah. the I will increase the effect of the noise, which is the error rate. I will increase the the error rate for the same energy per bit mm -hmm. which means for the same transmission power I use so remember if the range increases then we need more power we need more power to reach to so the effect of of uh, 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 um, of the noise becomes higher when we increase the range okay if we if we were to use the same the same power so, so mobile stations communicate only by associating themselves to uh, base stations. The typical range for cellular system ranges from 100 meters all the way to 35 kilometers in, in some cases. Oh, okay. In rural, uh, rural uh, areas where there is um, there's no obstacles, or line of sight, and everything is here. Is good and you are directing your transmission um, and there is no buildings there is nothing between you and the other side so uh, um, this is of course theoretical and you cannot achieve this 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 uh, this range in, in in normal cities by any means right. it's uh, for normal cities by the way it's uh, like at most maybe one kilometer or two kilometers not more than that um, and it depends on another thing, which is the frequency. Mm -hmm. Because as we said, the higher the frequency is, the, the, more, the, the faster the signal will decay, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we said that the received power is inversely, inversely proportional to the, 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 the square of the frequency, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that the transmission range reduces when you increase the frequency. So there are multiple factors that affect the typical range of a cellular system. We talked about three things. We talked about transmission power. We talked about type of modulation. And we talked about the frequency. So 
based on this, there are some recommendations that you should actually use small cell structures, especially for uh, for communication inside the the uh, the urban cities. Okay, so inside the cities, you should actually use smaller cells. Why? Because typically, this will increase the the capacity. Increasing the capacity here is defined by the number of users connected to the network. So if you have if you have a small uh, small cells, this means that you will have one cell which is small here, and another cell here, and another cell here, another cell here, and so on. you start having smaller cell as opposed to if you have one large cell with a large transmission range okay the capacity reduces why because the smaller cells will will actually serve will be able to serve more users okay than the bigger cell because for the big for the uh, the the long transmission range one base station will have to serve all these users and of course in that case it will not be possible for one base station to support the, the because one base station will have a limited bandwidth and as we said if we use FDMA remember if we if we divide the whole bandwidth into smaller sub channels each one of these users will require a certain amount of resources from the network so one base station will have limited capacity. So one base station will not be able to serve all these users. But if we have smaller cells, this will allow this cell, using spatial multiplexing, because this cell is, is, uh, is not, in, it is interfering, but with less interference. So any transmission here will appear as if it's a, it's a noise to the one next to it. So you can use special multiplexing, okay, together with FDMA to increase the capacity of the overall network, okay. So in that case, the smaller uh, cell structure is, is better. Also, another advantage that comes for free when you use small cell uh, structure is less transmission power. Why? Because for this case, don't you don't need that much power to reach to the base station, right? Mm. Whereas if you use, if we, you, if you were to use this uh, this uh, big cell structure, a user who is sitting here needs high amount of power in order to communicate with the base station. Okay. It's more robust and decentralized in the sense that. Each base station can serve these users independently from the other base stations. Okay? So this base station serves these users independently from this base station. So it's decentralized in a way. Whereas if we were to use the, the big cell structure, okay, one base station here will have to centralize the serving of all the users. So what is the impact of this? Well, for the decentralized case, if you want to measure robustness, you always measure robustness by, say, by assuming that one of the components is failed. So if this base station is down, this only those users will be affected, but all the other users will be fine. Right? So in that case, you have some redundancy in the system, and the impact of failure will be localized in a way. But all the other ones will be, will be fine. Versus if you use large okay. cell structure, all of them will be done. Right. All the users will be affected. Okay. The last one. Base station deals with interference and transmission area locally. So each, each base station deals with 
the the uh, the, the interference in a small area okay we'll have to deal with the interference in a small area versus by always by increasing the the area you have more probability and more sources of interference right but if you if you use small cell structure then you need to worry about uh, interference from a smaller area so the the number of sources for interference will will hopefully be less by increasing the space you have to deal with a with more sources of interference type does this come for free of course not so uh, small cell, cell structure if it has all these advantages does it have any disadvantage of course yes okay so there are some disadvantages for the small cell structure of course the infrastructure needed to connect all these base stations is more so if you have if you have small cell structure then you need more base stations which means that your hardware your infrastructure will be more complicated yeah will be more complicated so you need more hardware you need more devices to a, to have more uh, uh, base stations as part of your network architecture also handover is needed when changing from one cell to another so imagine one user is moving from from one side of the system to the other he will go through multiple, he will go through like, multiple base stations yeah. so from here to here he will have to hand over from one to another from one to another so he will have to perform handover many times mm -hmm. so, versus if we use larger cell structure he will not have to frequently hand over from one mm -hmm. place to another okay so that's another disadvantage the third disadvantage, which is probably the most um, uh, severe or the most critical, is uh, frequency planning. Because as we said... We want to avoid having interference between the cells. Right. So, to avoid interference, one thing we could do is to say, okay, we can allocate certain frequency range here and certain frequency range, and the two frequencies are far from each other. So we use kind of uh, some kind of... FDMA but between cells mm -hmm. and that's usually what happens mm -hmm. so usually within one cell they use FDMA slash TDMA we'll, we'll talk about that okay so they, they, they take one range and they subdivide it into smaller range okay and within that range they also use some TDMA okay from one cell to another they use also another level of FDMA <coughs> So, for example, from uh, at uh, 2.4 gigahertz, from 2. Point to from 2.4 gigahertz to 2.5 gigahertz is allocated to one cell, and from 2.5 to 2.6 is allocated to another cell. Now, within within the range of 2.5 to 2.4 to 2.5, this 0.1 megahertz is actually divided into few kilohertz for uh, 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 accommodating multiple channels and then each user will have to uh, to send over one channel and then over this channel I can allocate time slots so each user will have one channel at specific time so this way I can support many users okay and by subdividing the, 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 the capacity of the channel further I can increase or decrease the bandwidth per user so that's why if we increase the number of users per base, per, uh, per base station, the bit rate allocated for each user will have to be to decrease. Okay, so uh, I can allocate the resources of the network in any way I see appropriate, and I can stop at any point and say I cannot accommodate any more users because the number of users I have is a lot. Okay. But all these uh, time slots in each frequency will be uniform. Like if the number of users increases, we cannot divide that time slot into smaller ones. We can. Well, that's, again, it's up to us. And that's why we have different techniques and different things. And each one has, uh, has pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages. We'll, we'll talk about this in the next, uh, in the, in the next um, uh, uh, set of slides we, where we start talking about uh, <coughs> resource management. So, or resource allocation. That's a very interesting topic. And this is this is basically one of the most important topics. This is what you, this is what you will work on as part. So, 
we're, we're taking all these system resources and then we allocate it based on the user demands and based on the quality of service that this user expects and so on and so forth. So we can um, assign more time slots to users who have more quality uh, of service demands. Okay, so we have complete freedom in how we allocate these resources to the different users. And, uh, and I can use some kind of admission control to say, I will not admit this user into the system because what the number of users that I have is more than enough. And if I admit this user, I will not be able to give him or her the quality of service that they expect. So all this is a have to, take in, have to be taken into consideration. So frequency planning is needed to avoid interference between uh, transmitters using the same frequencies. Uh, um, and this can, can be uh, through some FDA, FDMA location. Or, of course, typically they don't use TDMA for, although they could, but yeah, it's not common. And the reason for this is the synchronization. So to synchronize the transmission between two base stations, it's quite hard. It's, uh, it's, it's really hard. And that's why typically they don't use TDMA to facilitate or mitigate the interference between two base stations. So they use it within one base station. Why? Because TDMA can be synchronized easily within one base station. Because one base station will be a centralized clock for all the users that are associated to it. So the base station will control when the time slot will start and end. Right? So it's easy for within uh, uh, the base station. But for enter base station interference, <coughs> usually they use FDMA or CDMA. CDMA is code division multiple access, which we talked about it before. So instead of allocating a frequency range, we allocate codes. We allocate orthogonal codes to the signal. Doctor, the, uh, the disadvantage of handover is just the over... Uh, the frequency of handovers, because handover is expensive. Uh, handover is, 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 is pretty expensive. Because imagine, I mean, if you, if you are, that's what happens is, I'm doing a phone call right now, okay? So handover does not take zero seconds. Of course, it takes a few seconds. Why? Because you have to move the resources allocated to this user from this base station to another base station, okay? It happens on multiple steps. First, you have to first make sure that you have resources in the new base station, which corresponds to the resources in the old base station. And sometimes, it's not one-to-one -one mapping because it depends on the frequency, it depends on the channel state of the new base station and how it is related to the old one. For example, you may need to allocate more time slots in the new one, more than the old one. It's, it's a difficult process. So first you have to allocate the resources in the new one and then you have to go back to the old one and release it. Otherwise they will be consumed, okay? And sometimes they have to do, they have to do, uh, actually in most of the time, they have to do it in a reverse order. Why? Because if you, if you first, if you first release the resources from the old one, and then start allocating in the new one, you might lose the connection. You might lose the connection between. Mm. Okay? So they usually, what they do typically is that they, first they allocate the resources in the new one, and then they go back to the old one and release, and release it. And this happens by the base station, not by the user. When the user gets associated to the new one, the base station will send to the old one to ask it to release the resources. So in, 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 in other words, handover is expensive process. It's not easy. And remember, there is a time uh, where you are allocating the resources on both sides. There is a small time in between that you are allocating some resources here and some resources here because we did not yet perform the handover completely. This handover sometimes stays for you know, hundreds of milliseconds, or sometimes maybe more than a second or so. More than a second? More than a second, yes. <clears throat> so in a way, it's expensive. And there are so many signaling codes that have to go back and forth in order to facilitate this handover. It's not easy. So it's pretty expensive. So. Um,
If I can avoid it, it would be, it would be good. But still, the, cell, the small cell structure is good, assuming the fact that the handover, on, generally speaking, on the entire system is not that high. In which case, the number of users who actually perform communication while they are moving, it's not 100% of the users, for sure. And how, how much? Maybe 5%, 10%? So still, I mean, uh, on the positive side, I'm gaining by, by using the, 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 the small cell structure. And of course, the small cell, cell structure is also motivated by the fundamental issue of the fact that the hardware cost drops. Okay? The more is low. The, 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 the hardware cost really drops. So having more hardware is easy for us. Okay? Because if it reflects on the revenue, it's actually... So we have more higher density of users, and the user density is always increasing. It's not decreasing in any way. Okay? So... Um, so to be able to support the increasing number of users with the same amount of hardware is, is, is a joke. So, uh, but actually doubling, doubling the hardware, if it leads to uh, quadruple the number of users that I support, this is good, because doubling the hardware is cheap. For me, it's cheap. Um, so the main thing becomes the complexity of planning. Uh, planning the interference between these cells. It's, uh, it's, it's not an easy process, um, uh, which is what we call frequency planning. So definitely, as you can imagine, I, I'm not going to have the, say, the, the same number of frequency ranges as the number of cells. If we assume that, then we're joking. Yeah, and we need that to have the, say, the same number of frequency ranges equal to the number of cells it's, 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 it's really hard. So we have to assume that these frequency ranges will have to be reused. Okay? But we need to be careful. We need to reuse it in between two cells that are very, very far apart from each other. So this way, especially we know that these cells, they will never interfere with each other. Okay? Because of the transmission range is too far. So they will never cause any interference to each other. Only in this case, we can use the same frequency range on both sides. So we can have one base station in 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 uh, Saeed, مثلاً, and another base station in uh, in in Ceylon Resort. So if well, actually they are close to each other. Oh, one in the south and one in the north. So if uh, if they are if they are far apart, then and only then we can use the same frequency. So that's, that's typically how it looks like. So we can assume that there is some frequency reuse, but only within certain distance. So we need to assume that if we, for example, we can use F1 here and F1 here. Right? But we have long distance between these two cells. Okay? But we need to have this frequency reuse because we can never have enough frequency ranges equal to the number of cells because we're talking about small cell structure. So by increasing the cells, the number of cells, we need more frequency ranges. And that's, that's, that will create some uh, congestion in the, in the overall spectrum. So we need, we need some frequency reuse type. So we have two types of frequency reuse. Either we make this frequency reuse assignment is fixed which means that we say okay this is f1 and f2 here f3 here four five six seven and so on so in that case we have eight eight frequency uh, uh, used in that system and then we repeat f1 and and two three four five six seven and so so this way we can cover the entire system with eight frequencies, okay? So we know that we can reuse all these eight frequencies all around the entire system. Eight, seven, five. Seven, sorry, seven. Seven, so, so from one to seven, yes. So seven, okay? Um, 
by the way, what, what, there is a there is a reason behind the fact that they are that they are using a hexagon to model the cell structure. You will use it, you will you will see that very commonly in the papers. It turns out that the hexagon is the most efficient shape to cover a large area. Because you know what? Typically, typically the actual cell in terms of transmission range does is not is not hexagon. Because it depends it depends on the transmission range and it depends on the obstacles around you, on fading and stuff. So the actual shape is not hexagon. But they use this to simplify the modeling. They use hexagon to simplify the modeling. And hexagon is the most efficient shape to cover a very large area. Okay, from the area perspective, from geography and Geometry kind of you know, side. Okay, so so fixed frequency assignment. <coughs> we assign the frequency ranges all around these cells, and we make it fixed. So what is the problem with this? So in that case, the problem. We will have different traffic load in different cells. Why? Because because if you remember. When we talked about frequency ranges, the, the type of fading and noise sources, depending on which frequency range you, you use, right? Yeah. So? Yeah. so for, for between one frequency and another, you have different types of interference and different devices that interfere with you and so on and so forth, right? So if we predefine, if we pre-assign and fix frequency range for each cell, throughout the time, this is not fair. Because one frequency range will have more interference than the other. Which means that the active throughput... Interference is through the, the, the cell itself. Initially. Yeah, within the cell itself. Yes, within the cell itself. Yes. So the interference within the cell itself will be different from the other frequency ranges. Why? Because inherently, in this frequency range, you have certain sources of interference. And in this frequency range, you may have higher or lower uh, sources of interference, right? So overall, you may have different sources of interference on each cell, which changes the throughput on each cell, right? So there are different traffic load in different cells due to different factors of interference, both within and from the other cells. So overall, it's not fair. It's not fair because this is what Dr. Muhammad has mentioned before, which is what we call frequency selective channel. Remember, we talked about frequency selective channel. That some channels are very sensitive, some environments are very sensitive in a, in a specific frequency range, which means that within that range, the fading is really high. Why? Because of the fundamental characteristic of the wireless signal. In this frequency range, the fading is higher or lower. We don't know. Okay? So by fixing, by fixing the same frequency, throughout a long period of time, it's not fair for the other cells, right? Because the interference inside here might be higher or lower. Here might be higher or lower. It's not fair for the users of the cell. For the users who are using this cell, right. Right? right. So either either you, 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 you move the users every now and then to a little way, you it's kick some there. users out and you, you, you send them to another cell, Okay, or easier, of course, if you can change the configuration of the cell, which means that the, 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 uh, the frequency planning is dynamic, which is this in this case. Of course, the good thing about this case is that by changing the frequency every now and then, overall throughout the time will be fair. Okay, so we allow the users to have sort of a consistent performance throughout the time. But on the other side, of course, there is a complexity associated to this. 
So what frequency range you allocate to a certain cell at a certain point in time? And when do we have to... And who allocate the frequencies for all the cells? The key is it's not... Yes, is there it, is... Is it, is it done on the cell side in each... The base station? It should be, we should have like centralized base station where it's divided. That's a, that's a correct way of thinking. Really, that's what happens. So there is a network controller, a centralized network controller. So when we talk about the, 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 the 3G and 4G network architecture, you will see that there is a base station and there is a network controller. It's a centralized device uh, uh, within the network which really does the dynamic frequency planning. And it says this base station now has this frequency and this base, sta base station now has this frequency and at a certain point in time it, it can switch. Okay. So it decides on all of this, uh, all of this issue. So there is a, there is a radio resource management within one base station where the base station can think about itself only and the local users around it, and tries to allocate its own users, okay, uh, the resources tries to allocate its own resources to the users, okay. And there is another level of radio resource management where the network controller can now say. You know, this, this uh, base station will have this set of resources, this base station will have this set of resources, and actually I may actually move around the resources and allocate more resources here and less resources here, which is what we will talk about as the, as the next level. So um, dynamic frequency assignment, on one hand, has given me the opportunity of being fair throughout the time, because then if, if, if we have uh, uh, higher interference, uh, in a certain frequency range, I will change the frequency every now and then, so I, I make it fair throughout the time. <clears throat> so overall, in terms of capacity for the dynamic frequency assignment, overall, on the average, the capacity will be, uh, will be you know, allocated more efficiently. Okay? But this, uh, this frequency allocation is based on the interference uh, from each cell. Like, if when one cell... Then right. Right, and I can actually, yeah, and I, uh, one, well, there's one point here. I can make this assignment based on some interference measurements. So based on uh, some measurements uh, uh, I have to do at this point in time, I say, okay, so this, uh, this cell has been encountering a very bad performance at this point in time. So I need to give it another frequency range which will pump up the, uh, the performance a little bit because the users in this cell have been experiencing really bad performance uh, due to some high level of interference. Mm -hmm. So I need to give it another frequency range which can possibly boost the, the performance a little bit. So who does this? The network controller, not the base station in that case. Because the base station has a local picture, but it does not have the global picture. Who has the global picture? A centralized device inside the network which manages the resources amongst all the base stations. Okay? Type. Um, so this is the frequency planning. So this actually, uh, uh, this uh, cell uh, structure uses uh, three, only three uh, frequencies. So this, they, they call it three cell cluster. Three cell cluster. So each cluster that uses each group of cells that use different frequencies, we call them a cluster. So we group the cells into clusters. So here we have a three uh, cell uh, clusters. He, here we have seven cell structure or seven cell cluster, which is what we talked about in the previous slide, which is we have one frequency F here and the all the other six around it, they use different frequency. As you can see here in this uh, three cell structure, the distance is a little bit small. So you have F1 here and F1 here. So the distance is a little bit small. So the probability of interference between these two cells increases a little bit. But here, the distance is really, really high. So the probability of interference will be really low. Um, so by increasing, increasing the, the, the number of, of frequency ranges, this actually restricts me to use maybe smaller range within each cell. Because if you have an overall spectrum, you can divide this spectrum on two levels. So you can divide it um, into three sections, which means that you are essentially using the three cell structure. So in, in each section you have... Number of people. You have, no, you have, you have 
larger frequency range that you can allocate within the cell. Mm -hmm. But in that case, the interference between each two cells is higher. Oh. Okay, so here you allocate the big spectrum into seven different ranges. So the per cell, the range is, is smaller. Okay but the interference between each two cells is lower, okay? So there is inter-symbol interference and there is intra-cell interference, which is the interference between two, with interference between, the the, within the, the cell itself, within the, the cell itself. This is the intra. This is the intra. The inter is between two cells, the effect of one cell over the other. But within the cell, the frequency will be the same. And how come interference comes? You have interference from other sources. From noise? Yes, from noise, but from other, other sources around you. Not from the other cell. You have from other sources. So the entire frequency is divided into three in three cluster, and it is divided into seven in seven cluster. Right, right. So this is an interesting configuration where you can use the directive antenna. Remember the directive antennas that we talked about? Antennas oh. with a specific. Okay, so we can further divide the, uh, the 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 cell because here we assume that the base station is has isotropic antenna, which means that the base station can actually send in all directions in the 360 degrees equally and with the same amount, with the same uh, pattern, right? Which means that within this range. I can send in any direction in the 360 degrees with the same quality, with the same uh, power, more or less, right? So there is, a, uh, there is a sector type of division which tries to use the directive antennas to have... Uh, that's what we have typically nowadays. If, we, if, if you look at the, uh, the base stations, you will see that the base station has some kind of a circular antenna. It actually divides the space using separate antenna in different directions. Each one of these is actually a directive antenna mm -hmm. which provides the communication in a, in a, certain, in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. So if you have three directed, di directional antennas, you are basically div dividing the, the, the cell mm -hmm. in the 360 mm -hmm. degrees into three smaller, we call them in that case, sector. Mm -hmm. Not cells, we call them sectors. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there is intersector interference in that yes. case. Of course, there is intersector interference in that case. So in that case, we need to to do the frequency planning on the level of the sector, not on the level of the cell itself. Okay. Sectorization is also done by network control. Sectorization, no, the frequency planning for different sectors is 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 also assigned by the network controller by the centralized the frequency planning of the different sectors. But sectorization itself is physically done by using the directive antennas with a specific shape. This actually dictates uh, 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 what the sectors look like, okay? So you have a directive antenna, you have one base station that has three directional antennas, which means that you are dividing the 360 degrees into three different sectors. Right? This is physical from the fact that you are using three directional antennas in three directions. Okay? So that this it's is the concept. sectorization. It's a concept. Yes, it's a, uh, but the frequencies, the frequency uh, 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 each of each sector is done by the, is assigned by the network controller. The by network, the control network controller. By the network controller, yes. I thought that the network controller will give the cell, like, the range for frequencies and this should be no 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 it deals with no no it deals with the, it sectors. deals with sectors as if it's like a cell yes okay. <clears throat> or or yeah uh, I got what you mean so you what you mean is um, I can I, I can allocate the frequencies on the cell level and then I give this frequency to the uh, the base station and the base station can then perform the cell, uh, sorry, the sector type of uh, frequency planning. Uh, it could be done this way. I, I don't see why not. I'm not sure when we, when we come to the standard, we will see if, 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 if it's done in two levels or it's done in one level by the network controller. Because I could do all the sector frequency planning 
directly from the centralized controller by the by the network controller or I can do a cell level frequency planning and send the cell send each cell the frequency range and then the cell itself will do the frequency planning I would think it is the first as I said in the beginning why because again the, the, the assigning the frequency in a sector depends on the frequency not of another sector in the same cell but in another, another sector maybe in a different cell yes, so okay. that's why in assigning a frequency of a certain sector uh, I need to have a global picture not just a local picture mm -hmm. right. so which, which really indicates to me that it's more logical that the network controller will have to, to do the sector level frequency planning not uh, the base station <coughs> So, um, so we can we can possibly explain this and, and then give a, a brief introduction in, uh, about the, the new chapter and then stop. Um, so there is the, the concept of cell breathing, or sometimes they call it cell zooming. Okay. So <clears throat> what we have talked about so far assumes that each cell has a, a, a range which is fixed and all I'm doing is just I'm planning the frequency range in the different cells okay using dynamic frequency mm -hmm. assignment here we're talking about the concept of cell breathing or cell zooming which means that the size remember of the if the size of the, the size of the cell itself can uh, shrink or grow depending on the demand so when the demand is higher I should make it smaller or larger which way this will affect the interference with other cells it does affect the interference with other cells when the demand I know is that you should make it smaller now again this is this is another thing that should be done on a global level not on a local level so mm -hmm. when a cell increases or grows its transmission hmm, it doesn't do that independent from the other cells so it should actually consult with the network controller and the network controller will have to eat to do shrink that the on the cells. yes so when you grow in a certain level you shrink the other one my question is if the user capacity increases should I grow or shrink shrink, shrink Rabbi because I should shrink be that's, that's the main reason why we, we say that the small cell structure is more in the capacity level, right? right. Mm -hmm. So when I reduce, it's essentially, I'm actually switching from the uh, uh, large cell structure to a small cell structure. Mm -hmm. So if the user density increases, I'm, I'm actually trying to reduce in order to provide enough resources to the users that are already there. And all the users uh, in the in the in the far part of the cell, I'm essentially switching them to other cells, to other neighboring cells. Okay. okay. <clears throat> uh, 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 lately, we have started to talk about the 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 type of seasonal uh, uh, cellular networks where using this concept we are essentially we, we, we what we could do is that we can reduce we can do cell breathing for some cells um, but if we increase if we grow other cells the, 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 if the user density increases a lot other other cells will have to grow to compensate for the cell breathing here right but if other users grow and they have higher capacity in terms of users they need to actually shrink, not grow, right? right? So we, are, we, we could come into a situation that we need all the cells to shrink in order to provide enough resources, but if all the users shrink, we will have some users in between with no coverage. Right. So we need, we need to have more base stations on demand waiting for these situations to happen. Um, that could typically... Uh, happen in a situations like in, in the World Cup mm -hmm. or 
in some seasonal events or some international conference, everybody came to Doha and we have you know a huge event and stuff like that. So the, the, the user density has grown to a levels that has never been experienced before. So in that case, um, we need smaller cells to account for this capacity, but um, we cannot grow other cells. So we have to, we have to have a way of getting more resources into the network. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do this is by deploying other base stations. Um, so that's why uh, they are now, in, as part of 5G, they are trying to have the concept of deploying on-demand base stations using, some cases, drones. Mm -hmm. You know the drones? Drones, quadcopters. Okay. Eh? Quadcopters, drones, they take photographs on all nowadays. Yeah. Okay. So they can deploy base stations. They call them aerial base stations. It's like you have a, an airplane, or in that case, it's a helicopter. Or a, in, in, in nowadays, they are talking about drones as like a, an un, unmanned aerial vehicles. Mm. They have, they have, they they, they, they they get deployed on demand in these events, and they have a base station, which in that case is a, is a, is a, is a low-scale base station, and they deploy it in the air. Okay? So um, this will essentially communicate with the other base stations and increase the capacity of the system. Temporarily. And then when the event is finished, I don't need them. They have that coverage on wheels, no? Mobile base stations. Yes, or you can have it. You can have a base station inside uh, a mobile car, and but the but, but but the problem is that you need some places on ground to host these base stations. So in some cases, if you deploy it in the air, it's easier because you don't need any 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 spaces on ground. So um, <clears throat> so based on the application, you have different ways of of of, of doing that. Um, so nowadays, with the with the widespread use of drones and stuff, they thought about deploying this. They call they call them aerial base stations, and there is a there is a huge amount of research in this area now because all the channel models and everything that we've talked about changes when you talk about this type of, of, of base stations. So they talk about how the channel model looks like and and how it affects the performance of the entire system. Does it really add capacity, or maybe it adds some overhead, or... So, there is a huge amount of research in that. Okay. Okay. And the fact that it's moving yeah. changes and makes the channel model really interesting, because it moves. It may actually move to one place or another. Right. And it's affected by wind, it's affected by uh, um, uh, rains, and it's, 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 a, it's a, a very interesting situation. Mm. Cell breathing means dynamically changing the yes. size of the Yes, so system. yes, so cell breathing here talks about the fact that we can change that transmission range. And how how do we do this? Is by using a different transmission power from the base station. That's it. That's essentially how we do it. So the base station decides to drop the transmission power from certain limit to certain limit. So this essentially is equivalent to the fact that instead of having this longer transmission range, we have this small one. That's it. That's all we do. Okay? Uh, but this has to be, again, done carefully uh, 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 for a group of cells to, to not leave a user without coverage. Okay? So, uh, this is particularly done <clears throat> for the case of uh, 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 of code division multiplexing uh, uh, systems, um, for code division multiplexing systems, the the uh, we as we will see in a minute, the, for code division multiplexing, we do the the assignment not based on the frequency in that case, based on the code. So essentially, all the cells may actually use the same frequency. And then we allocate the codes to the different cell, not allocate the frequency to the different cell. So we use all the same frequency on all cells, and we allocate the codes. But uh, remember here 
we talked about an effect for the CDM, which is the near-far effect. We talked about this before, right? Yeah. The near-far effect. Did we talk about this? Mm -hmm. Did we talk about this? I don't think so. No. Okay, so, okay. so when we come to this, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later. I may have actually explained it in another course. Um, so in that case, uh, the additional uh, the additional traffic on the other um, uh, 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 networks will appear as noise. If the noise level is too high, users drop out. So that's the that's when I I need to do the cell zooming or the cell breathing. I need to reduce the <coughs> reduce the coverage of one because sometimes I do the cell breathing to uh, account or to reduce the inter cell interference. So in some cases, I actually do the cell breathing to account or to uh, reduce the intercell interference. So um, if, if, uh, if I use this long range, sometimes the interference with the neighboring cells will be higher. Okay? So, so cell breathing is a way to increase the capacity of the system to respond to uh, uh, an increased user density okay and also in some cases I'm trying to do cell breathing not to increase <coughs> the capacity for that user density but, but to, to reduce the, the interference, interference to other cells it's only reducing or you can expanding is also called cell breathing or only reducing? no well cell cell breathing well cell breathing is it's changing the size the special size of the cell through of course adjusting the transmission range Right, so it could be grow or or or, or shrink, right? Um, but the reason for this is actually two things: either uh, to respond to an increased user uh, density, in which case we want to increase the amount of resources per user, okay, or if we want to mitigate the uh, inter cell interference, inter cell interference, okay. <coughs> so. I think this is the last uh, slide. So, so for CDMA frequency reuse, it's simple because we're talking about for FDMA reuse, we have to use different frequency for each cell, uh, which is the example that we just talked about. So if we have seven uh, frequency cell cluster, mm -hmm. this is how it looks like. Versus for the case of uh, CDMA, we have the same frequency, but frequency. but in that case, we use different codes mm -hmm. uh, for each uh, for each cell. So we have to make sure that the codes used on each cell is different. Mm -hmm. So it actually moves from a cell, uh, cell uh, a frequency planning to code planning. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially it corresponds to each other, but each one has some pros and some cons, some some advantages and disadvantages. Um, so until actually. Uh, 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 3G until 3G CDMA was really dominating they have found so many benefits of using CDMA uh, it has been dominating 3G completely okay uh, until they have um, invented what they call orthogonal FDMA orthogonal FDMA um, uh, once they have you know, invented this orthogonal DMA, and of course, this was a big revolution. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about this when we get to 4G, hopefully. Um, they started to see that the benefits of CDMA has been almost lost. So in 4G, OFDMA has, has dominated. Okay, so starting from 2G, 2G was FDMA slash TDMA. Okay, 3G, you can call it CDMA based. Okay, uh, 4G OFDMA, and starting from 4G, it has become OFDMA. Okay. So this is 3G. This is the standard UMTS and IS 2000. Okay, UMTS and I uh, and IS 2000. These are both 3G standards. So 3G standards, as you can see here, they use both. They use this is wide band CDMA. And this is CDMA 2000. Mm -hmm. This was in the States and this was in Europe. Okay. okay? So those two standards, 
they talk about 3G and both they use CDMA as the uh, uh, radio technology in the physical area. Different frequencies used for four dimensional multiplexing. UMTS uses a different frequency for WCDMA and IS2000 uses a different frequency for... No, no, frequency planning is another issue. These are two different standards. Dif two di these are two different standards, which means that each standard, as we will see later, they define different architecture for the entire system. So, for example, for UMTS and these and GSM, okay, they divide the architecture into base station, user equipment, a network controller, and these kind of things. Here, they may actually divide, define a different architecture. And each, each uh, uh, component in the system uh, may have different functionality, slightly different, okay? Um, based on that, there is some protocol, you know, signaling protocol to facilitate the frequency planning, to facilitate uh, 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 handovers, to facilitate all these kind of things, okay? So this signaling is done differently between each of these uh, standards. So each standard defines its own signaling to facilitate handover, to facilitate frequency planning, to facilitate what technology, CDMA, how CDMA is handled, <coughs> how the codes are distributed among the cells, and so on and so forth. Okay. So are they compatible with each other? They are compatible in the sense that, yes. So for, uh, actually, the, this affects the hardware design of, this, of the phone itself. Right, this was my right. question. Like how will yes, so the device itself has to be designed with one of these standards. And usually, it's designed based on one standard only. Because if you have a, 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 a cell phone with two standards, this means that the hardware will be almost double. Mm. Right. So yeah. that the, the area of the phone becomes bulky more, you know, uh, bigger. So, uh, so that's why, so that's why, yes, so that's why you have some phones in the States, which in the past we used to bring some phones from the States, they don't, they don't work here. Because they are designed based on this standard. They, they cannot use UMTS. Okay, so during 3G, UMTS was the, the standard that we use here in Qatar, or the standard that, that we use normally in the Middle East. So if you bring another phone from the States, it uses this, it cannot work here. Okay? So this affects really the hardware design. Okay? Even if you use the hard, different hardware for different uh, models, I mean, uh, is it compatible? The technology is compatible? For, for no, intercommunication no, between no, Europe and no, US. No, 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 because the base station has, but the base station also has to have a hardware which is compatible to one of these, not not both. Because again, if you want to have a base station that understands both standards, then this will double the cost. I mean, why would any carrier want to double the cost just to be able to uh, uh, support few users who are coming from the states? Those of you, man. So, so there will be some mediator to communicate, intercontinental communication. No? So huh? There will be some mediator for intercontinental communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another story. Yes, yeah. yes, of course. Of course. There is, a, there is a, some gateways. Mm -hmm. There are some gateways which... Uh, so each of these standards has to define a gateway. Mm -hmm. Okay? The gateway is the one that moves from one technology to Internet. another. But this assumes that the user has to move completely or you have to support another type of users on the other network. Okay? Okay, so any question here? So that's, uh, this is the, so starting from now, I think we can defer it to next time. So by now we have finished all the, all the issues that we need to talk about in the physical layer. So starting from next time, inshallah, we'll, we'll get away from the basement and go to the first floor. Yeah. We, we start looking at the physical layer resources as abstract resources. How can we allocate these resources amongst the users? Yeah. How can we allocate these resources amongst base stations, amongst users and stuff, which is the radio resource management. Mm -hmm. It's the layer above and uh, uh, that, that, that's used to, re to manage. And what is the advantage and disadvantage of each type of 
uh, uh, techniques that uh, advocates certain way of allocating these these resources to different users. Okay. Right. And usually this is more or less what what typically you know, students would like to work on. Yeah. Yeah. But it's good to have all this in your mind because when you when you design your ready resource management technique and stuff, you need to have all this concept in mind. Okay. So you need to understand what is the implication, what is the effect of designing uh, the resources in a certain way from the physical layer perspective. Okay. Uh, doctor, the GSM uses FDMA, TDMA, and, right. uh, and 3G uses WCDMA or I2000. Right. No, uh, CDMA. C uses CDMA. Uh, this uh, W is part of the of the standard name, okay. but the technology is CDMA. CDMA. Mm -hmm. So this is called LD, no? UMTS uses what they call wide band CDMA, mm -hmm. and why wide band? Because it assumes that it's one frequency, which is used by all the cells. So I can increase the bandwidth of the entire system and make it really wide band, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm using that same wide band for all cells. I don't have to divide it into uh, a frequency and use frequency planning like here, okay? <clears throat> but in any case, the technology for uh, uh, for UMTS is still CDMA. For both, it's CDMA. So we'll talk about CDMA again uh, later and, um, and and talk about the, the, the advantages and disadvantages. And 4G uses entirely different technology LTE. Or is it linked to 4, 4G uses? 4G, 4G, 4G uses OFDMA. Oh, yeah. It uses some type of uh, 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 FDMA but it's orthogonal, they call it orthogonal FDMA. So, we so are in 4G. For all of DMA, basically, you can understand it in an abstract way that we can use, we can have a, a fine grain level of frequency use for each user such that these frequencies are the same, but they are orthogonal to each other. So, this way we can have more fine grain level of frequency reuse on the user level. Mm -hmm. So this means really that we can squeeze the spectrum and, uh, and increase the spectral efficiency really, really high. So in that case, we actually don't need, uh, we, we don't need CDMA because as we said, for C CDMA, the good thing about CDMA is that we can send two, mesh, two, two, two uh, um, user equipments can send on the same frequency by using different codes. Mm -hmm. But again, I mean, CDMA still spreads the signal Okay, using the codes. So the code has an effect that it spreads the signal in the frequency domain. Mm -hmm. So we have both signals, they spread amongst the, 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 the channel frequency. So, um, so even though we can reuse the frequency, but the single user signal will have to spread in a larger bandwidth. Okay? But it, the good thing about it is that we can send within the same frequency and we, we, we don't have any collision. So we can extract one from the other using the codes. That's one. Orthogonal, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing has the same effect. I can send using the same frequency, but the frequencies are somehow orthogonal to each other. So we'll talk about there is no F TDMA or FDMA. There is no... Like no, there is, there is, there, there, is, there, is, there, is, there is, there is. Orthogonal FDMA plus TDMA. Yeah? Orthogonal yes, FDMA yes. FDMA. In that case, each orthogonal frequency can be divided into time slots. Same thing. So in that case, you can think of the frequency ranges. They are overlapping. Because FDMA here assumes that the signal, uh, sorry, the, the frequency ranges are far from each other, right? Mm -hmm. Far from each other. And there is a certain gap. Mm -hmm. No orthogonal... Uh, Orthogonal frequency division of flexing assumes that the frequencies are overlapping. It's orthogonal means how come frequency become orthogonal to each other? Like it's 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 really interesting. So the uh, so the, the, the frequencies are overlapping, but the places where they overlap, one of the frequency will have high signal and the other one will have zero. They overlap, but they overlap in a certain way so that at the place where they overlap, there is 
one, one, one of them would dominate and the other one would be zero. And there is another part where the other one dominates and the other one is zero. So they switch. Is it a phase shift or is it? It's, no, it's a time shift. It's a time shift, not phase shift in that case. It's a time shift. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's quite interesting. <clears throat> Okay, so any questions?